Welcome to Gospel Commission. I hope you're blessed in the Lord today. Today we're going to jump into the topic of irresistible grace, and we're going to try to define that according to the Calvinistic system. We've been talking through TULIP, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints, and today we're on that fourth point of irresistible grace. Now, the first thing we need to understand about the idea of irresistible grace is that it's necessary because of the idea of total depravity. Total depravity was created by Augustine in the 5th century. He created uh, total depravity, which namely states that a human being is born with such a sinful nature that their constitution and their nature is made up in such a way that they could never choose to repent or believe. And therefore, God is the one that unconditionally elects them, and God is the one that must irresistibly draw them. Now, this is the idea of Augustine. It wasn't embraced fully by the church at that time, but later Luther uh, accepted it, and so did Calvin. Calvin also, him and his disciples, added a couple more, namely limited atonement and perseverance of the saints to the whole system. But we won't go into that. We've talked about that in other videos. But the main point is that if you have total depravity, then by necessity, philosophical necessity, you have irresistible grace. If a person cannot repent and believe, God is the one that has to cause them to repent and believe. Now, this total depravity is different than moral depravity. It includes the idea that men do not choose to repent and believe because they're, they morally are against it, that they don't want to choose. But it adds something on top of that. Even Charles Finney believed that human beings could not choose righteousness because they did not want it. In other words, they were morally depraved. But this idea adds to it that in their constitution, in their very makeup as a human creature, their very nature, they could never choose it. As, uh, for example, a, we have a lot of mango trees here in the yard that often drop mangoes. Those mango trees will never drop papaya because it is not according to their nature. And so the same way, uh, a man who is born totally depraved will never choose to repent and believe because it's against their very nature. So the idea is not just morally depraved, but also total inability. So sometimes people won't say total depravity, they'll say total inability. And if you have total inability, then you must have irresistible grace. It's, it's a necessity philosophically. Now I want to say about irresistible grace that it is not this idea that God influences someone so strongly that they can't resist it. That is not the idea that is taught by Calvinism. For example, uh, we see that Paul, the apostle, was dealt with in a way that was different than other people of his generation. Caiaphas wasn't shown a vision of the risen Christ and blinded by that truth. He wasn't, he wasn't dealt with in that way, but Paul was. So he was influenced in a very strong way that may, maybe we could say is irresistible. It was so strong, how could he deny it? That's not what the doctrine of irresistible grace is talking about. I, myself, I was an atheist. I did not believe in Christ. I was against the Christian religion in every way, shape, or form. And one night I was driving in my car. The presence of God came in the car. I knew that Jesus Christ had come from heaven. If I didn't serve him the rest of my life, I would go to hell forever. Immediately, I repented and trusted in him. Now, that was a strong influence. My friends didn't have that experience. They didn't have that strong influence in their life that seems almost irresistible. But when we're talking about irresistible grace, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something different. Because this would be under the model of God influencing us and us responding. But the Calvinistic idea is more of a cause and effect. Since God is the one that determines all things, in this idea of irresistible grace, he is the one that causes regeneration. And because that regeneration is caused, then the effect of it is that somebody repents and believes. So it's a, a cause and effect idea instead of an influence and a response idea. So usually, or many people, will, instead, of saying total to, or instead of saying irresistible grace, they will say the effectual call. In other words, that God's call goes out he goes out with the gospel to everybody, inviting all to repent and believe, but there is an effectual call that goes out only to the elect, and it does something in their hearts to change them so that then they will repent and believe. And this is the idea of monergistic regeneration. Regeneration just means to be born again, to be made new on the inside, to be made into a new creation. Monergistic just means that, in this case, God is the only one working. He's the only one doing the act. So it's not that, that uh, God comes to somebody and they, 
they're so influenced that they can't resist it. No, God comes to somebody and changes them before they even know anything is happening. God monergistically regenerates, regenerates them, makes him to them into a new creature. And then as a new creature, he changes the mango tree into the papaya tree. And then the papaya tree cannot do anything except produce papayas because it's according to the nature. In the same way, somebody that's been born again according to the system, once they've been born again, they cannot produce anything but repentance and faith. It's a gift of faith. It's a gift of repentance. And that gift is given because it's the effect of somebody being monergistically regenerated, regenerated by God's power alone without any other uh, action making it take place. It's only God that does it. It's not the choice of men. That's why it's called irresistible because men's choice is not involved in it. But man's choice after they're regenerated, then they choose to repent and they choose to believe after the cause, then the effect. So this is effectual call or monergistic regeneration. So this leads to the idea that in Calvinism, the order of somebody coming to salvation is not that they're called to, that they're convicted of their sins, they're led to repentance, then they're influenced to faith. And then when they believe, they're justified. And when they're justified, they're given the spirit of God. And by the spirit of God, then they work out their salvation as God works in them. That's not the order of salvation in the Calvinist system. Instead, the idea is that God comes to somebody who is completely unable to repent and believe, unable to become a Christian and by his own power, he changes them into a new creation. He causes them to be born again. After they are born again, then that naturally leads, the effect of that is that they repent, that they believe, they're justified, and they already had the spirit at the beginning when they are monergistically regenerated. So we see there's a different order. Instead of repentance, faith, justification, and receiving the spirit, like we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, instead the idea is that somebody who receives the spirit first, they're regenerated first, born again first, and then the effect is that they repent, believe, and then are justified. So this is the basic idea, according to Calvinism, what irresistible grace is. It's not influence and response, but cause and effect. It's an effectual call that God gives to somebody. He monergistically changes them, makes them into a new creation, and then they repent and believe. This is why it cannot be resisted, because God does it before man's will is even involved in the process. Hope this is helpful. In the next videos, we will jump into the ideas of why this is unbiblical and why this is uh, inaccurate according to history and according to the scripture. God bless.